Uh, when you uh, talk about uh, diseases and pests in orchids or in anything else, uh, uh, probably the most important thing to remind oneself of is the, is the cell theory. Uh, and you all remember that from your biology class, that all protoplasm comes from previously existing uh, protoplasm. And uh, in order to have a disease or a pest, uh, you have to have living, uh, living things, and it has to come from somewhere. And uh, unfortunately, here in South Florida, the conditions that make it so easy to grow orchids um, make it uh, easy to have problems with all the pests of orchids because of all the tropical plants that are around in our yards and so forth. So uh, at the introduction to Florida orchid growing, uh, I point out that it's easy to grow orchids in South Florida, but it's easy to grow them badly. And in some ways, it's more difficult to grow them to perfection here than it is up north. Uh, the same is true of tomatoes. You know, uh, tomatoes really grow very well here, uh, but uh, there are all the pests of tomatoes are also here. The same with orchids. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, when we talk about uh, uh, disease and pest prevention, you know, people always like to talk about a triangle, and you need three elements for uh, a disease or a pest to be present in a crop. First of all, you need the host. Uh, that's our orchids. We don't want to get rid of that. Uh, uh, and uh, the pest, of course, we do want to get rid of. And then the third factor is the vector. So that triangle, they talk about, uh, one oftentimes talks about breaking that triangle. And uh, you can either break that triangle uh, in, in several different ways. Uh, if you look first at the host, uh, um, you want to uh, grow plants that are as disease and pest resistant as possible. You want plants that are strong and well adapted uh, here. If you try to grow uh, plants that are marginal here, uh, you're going to be beset with, with pests and to be set with diseases. But uh, if you uh, choose plants that are well adapted to the climate, uh, that are hardy, um, uh, oftentimes hybrids are much more vigorous than species. So if you have your heart set on growing species, you know, be aware that they're going to be more difficult for you to grow. They're going to be more problematical in most cases. Uh, one of the reasons that we produce hybrids is to produce plants that are stronger. It's, it's the Muhammad Ali uh, principle. As he said, uh, you know, what you want is a white uh, granddaddy back there somewhere, you know, and that's what produces the most beautiful and the strongest people. And it's absolutely the case with, uh, with orchids as well. You know, uh, uh, orchids of, uh, that are hybrids have hybrid vigor, hybrosis. Uh, so choosing uh, a hardy plant is important. Choosing a healthy plant is important. Um, there's only one thing that's uh, worth uh, less than a, uh, a dead orchid. And that's a diseased orchid. Uh, because not only is the, uh, you're likely to lose that plant, but the plant can infect other plants as well. So when you're buying plants, be sure you buy clean stock. Uh, and uh, when you're uh, dealing with plants in your collection, if you perceive a, uh, a problem, uh, then uh, you need to deal with it promptly because if not, uh, it's going to, not going to go away. Uh, it's more likely to multiply. It's more likely to propagate itself to your other orchids. So the key to, uh, to solving that problem, of course, is observation. Uh, you know, we like to get everybody to take the orchid growers pledge, which is I will look at every one of my orchids every day. Observation uh, is the way in which we are able to nip uh, problems in the bud. Uh, and if we see a problem developing, uh, don't wait to deal with it. Deal with it uh, then. Uh, they say in Spanish, uh, the, what makes the crops grow is the la sombra del amo. You need the master's shadow. Or we say in English, the master's eye fattens his cattle. So observation uh, is the key. I was once uh, called as an expert witness in a uh, lawsuit uh, alleging that, uh, uh, that a grower was sold some defective uh, uh, potting material. And uh, the uh, plaintiff's uh, attorney uh, said to me, well, you know, orchids are, are slow growing crop. You know, how long would it take you to notice that something was going wrong with them? And the answer that I get, the guy gave was not what he wanted to hear. I said, uh, you know, uh, two, maybe three days. And if you're keyed into your plants and are aware of uh, how your plants are growing and what they're doing, you will be aware 
within a day or two if, uh, if something is going wrong. So uh, uh, you want to uh, deal with it. And if you see something going wrong, you're going to want to find out uh, what's wrong with it. There are several ways to find out. There is this wonderful book here, which I bring. Uh, there's also Florida Orchid Growing month by month. But uh, uh, there are, uh, uh, this book has the latest information on uh, both disease and pest control. Uh, you will not find any more recent uh, literature on this unless you do some serious uh, research. So in terms of availability, this, uh, this is the, uh, the book you want for this. Florida Orchid Growing has very good information in it also. This has the, uh, this has the very best, the very best. Uh, and uh, it happens to be on sale today too, <laughs> said he with a small commercial note. But uh, going to the literature is one place where you can see if you have a problem and identify it. Identifying the problem, of course, is absolutely essential. Uh, the county agent is another place where you can go. You can look them up in the telephone directory under uh, Dade County agent, uh, whatever, Broward County agent. And uh, they have people who uh, are urban uh, horticulturists whose job it is to help you uh, solve uh, problems. You can also take your problems to an orchid society or people frequently bring them to us. They'll bring a plant and ask for us to diagnose it. And, diagnose it. and uh, you know, we're always glad to do that. That's not a, uh, that's not a problem, uh, you know. Uh, best to put it probably in a plastic bag, but uh, in any case, if you have problems, you can bring them to the grower. You can definitely, uh, should always think of taking it back to whoever sold you this plant. Uh, and if they sold it to you any time recently, uh, you might want to take it back to them and see whether they shouldn't be responsible for it. But uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we always stand behind our material and we're always ready to help our customers uh, solve their problems. Uh, okay, so uh, Let's look at what kind of problems can exist. Uh, probably uh, more than anything else here in, uh, in South Florida, we have a number of problems with, uh, with fungus. And uh, there are uh, uh, one or two exotic fungus that uh, we rarely uh, see. But mostly the fungus that we encounter here in South Florida fall into uh, two categories, leaf spotting fungus and uh, what are known as the water molds, Pythium and Phytophthora. And these two uh, classes of diseases are treated in entirely different ways. Uh, and the, uh, the best thing to do is to establish a regular spray program. In Florida Orchid Growing Month by Month, we have one outlined there which will uh, suggest to you what you should be spraying on a regular basis and that will keep your plants uh, clear of disease and uh, of, uh, of other pests. Uh, back to those leaf spotting fungi, uh, there are literally literally uh, scores of them. Uh, I've got a, a rather thick uh, pamphlet uh, issued by the state of Florida on orchid diseases. And, uh, uh, but uh, used to be that uh, in the old days when uh, you had a fungus problem, you would send the plant off to uh, Gainesville to be an analyzed and they would almost come back, invariably come back to, with the answer, Benlate spray it with benlate. And of course, benlate proved to be a disaster because uh, contaminated forms of it got out there and destroyed everybody's crop, including ours. But uh, now the go-to chemical that is universally applied because for these leaf spotting uh, fungi is thiophanate methyl. It's also uh, sold under the brand names of Clary's 3336 or Thiamil. Uh, and it is a systemic, and in order for a systemic chemical to work properly, you need to apply it properly. And uh, uh, the uh, way to apply it is to apply it initially, and then to apply it again in two weeks, and then apply it every five to six weeks thereafter. And in Florida Orchid Growing, we recommend that you begin this program before the rainy season is in full swing. Usually the first week in May is the most recommended time. And then you spray them again uh, six weeks uh, on from that in the middle of June. And then you, uh, excuse me, spray them on two weeks after that uh, towards the end of May. And then you spray them every, uh, uh, every six weeks thereafter. So initial spray, spray in two weeks, 
and then spray every five to six weeks. What you're doing is you are building up the uh, immunity in the, uh, in the plant uh, itself so that the plant is basically immunized against these diseases. It's a preventive rather than a cure and it is always easier to prevent. Uh, what the name is thi the che chemicals have several names. They're like uh, old possum's book of practical cats. You know, a cat must have three different names. Well, a, a chemical uh, must have three different names also. It has the chemical name, and then it has uh, a uh, a brand name. Uh, it has a scientific name. It has a chemical name, and then it has a brand name. And the chemical name of this chemical I'm suggesting to you is thiophanate methyl. It is sold under the brand names of Clary's 3336 and Thiamil. Yes, ma'am. And uh, this is all in uh, both uh, Florida Vanda growing here and in Florida orchid growing. Uh, uh, if you have a copy, you can look them up. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the virtue of this uh, is that it's a broad spectrum of fungicide and it will cover just about all of the leaf spotting fungi that you run into. It is also quite effective against uh, root rots, uh, which are caused by another uh, set of pathogens that belong to the genus uh, Fusarium. So Fusarium root rot, stem rot of uh, uh, Vandas and of Cattleyas is also controlled by this uh, chemical thiophanate methyl, but it is best when you apply it in a prophylactic way, a preventative way. So you want to build up that immunity in your plants before the rainy season comes, before they can get infected. If they are infected uh, with the disease, some of uh, these uh, things can simply be cut away. Uh, uh, you can also, uh, uh, for certain uh, uh, diseases, you can make a slurry of, uh, of the fungicide and paint it on. I want to strongly advise you, and not, not advise you, warn you, don't ever dust a chemical on your plants. You no se panga el polvo uh, the uh, chemical. You put it, no, por uh, liquido. Uh, you want to do it in, in a slurry. In a, you don't, uh, you know, several million cocaine addicts couldn't be wrong about an effective way to get a chemical into your body. Uh, it's by, by uh, breathing it in, into your lungs. Uh, you want to avoid that at all cost. When you're handling chemicals, we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Uh, you want to, that's another point at which you want to avoid that. And we'll talk about how to do that uh, here in a little bit. But uh, you make a slurry, you take the, a little bit of water and uh, make a, a, a paste and you paint it on. Uh, uh, and uh, that can be very effective on certain spotting, uh, leaf spotting diseases. Uh, uh, okay, uh, um, the... Thiophanate methyl is the chemical for these diseases, and uh, there are several others that are mentioned in uh, uh, Florida orchid growing, and particularly in Florida Vanda growing. Uh, some of them are very expensive and are hard to get. Thiophanate methyl is readily available from the suppliers. Again, in the back of both books, you have a list of, uh, of sources for uh, uh, chemicals and sources for uh, uh, supplies. And uh, here you go, uh, sources. And you can, these are the places where you can get all of the, th the things that I'm suggesting to you. You had a question, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, if you know, you can uh, take a clean knife, a knife that's been sterilized, and we're going to talk a little bit about virus later on, uh, uh, and I'll talk, explain to you how you uh, best sterilize uh, instruments. But a clean instrument, you cut it away if you see spots. Uh, the exception to that, of course, is if the spots have been caused by sunburn. Uh, when a leaf has been sunburned, uh, uh, it's, uh, it simply is not uh, going to spread any further than it spreads. You're best just leaving the plant where it is, and you're leaving you leave the spot as it is, and eventually uh, when you have enough leaves to replace it, you can cut that leaf away. But if it's spreading, if it's growing, uh, then you want to cut that leaf, absolutely. And the other thing you want to do is you want to take any plant that uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, infected and put it into a dry area. Water, of course, is the great vector of uh, all orchid diseases. Uh, and uh, uh, that is why uh, when we teach the introductory course here, we emphasize that the most important thing to know about your orchids is how to dry them out. 
you always want to dry your orchids out to the degree that they want to be dry. Uh, and of course here in South Florida, one of our major problems is that late in the summer and uh, early in the fall, it uh, is altogether too wet. So we frequently have more rain than uh, we want to uh, because water is the great vector of all orchid diseases. Uh, there are a couple of orchid diseases that are spread uh, by simply uh, contact. Uh, rather unusual, uh, but they can be very, very devastating. Uh, our southern blight, uh, again, it's illustrated in Florida orchid growing uh, uh, and in uh, Florida vanda growing. A uh, devastating disease that uh, is unfortunately also very common in St. Augustine grass. So we occasionally see it, uh, there's information about it uh, and how to control it in, uh, in Florida orchid growing. Uh, but for most diseases, it's water. So the drier that you can keep your plants, you, you want to keep your uh, plants as dry as you can and still growing strongly. Uh, and um, uh, we always advise people to the question to ask when you buy a new orchid that you don't know about, ask how much does this orchid want to dry out? Don't ask how much water does it want. Uh, uh, ask how much it wants to dry out because no matter what season it is, whether it's the dry season like now uh, or whether it's the rainy season, if you know how much the plant wants to dry out, then you can get, make sure that it's getting the conditions that, that it wants. Uh, different orchids have different drying regimens, regimes and the, uh, you need to know which one is proper for your orchid. So water is the great enemy. Uh, can you explain the, when the, the concept you say drying out? Uh, a cattleya likes to, or a dendrobium uh, likes to dry out hard. They're like really truly like cactus. Uh, Phalaenopsis like to dry out barely, uh, but they do like to dry out. They, they don't want to be kept constantly wet. No orchid likes to be kept constantly wet, so, uh, period. Okay. When you Except Pachyon petals. I was thinking about a time frame, like days or weeks. Uh, uh, that's the wrong frame of mind to have. That's why, that's why these books are uh, month by month. Uh, are you talking about uh, watering it twice a week uh, when uh, you're going to have a temperature like you're having today of 86 and a relative humidity of uh, 45? Or are you talking about uh, watering it uh, uh, once a week when uh, you are at a weekend in, uh, week in September where the uh, temperature is also 85 but the relative humidity is 90 and uh, it has, uh, you've gotten uh, uh, eight inches of rain in the last uh, two weeks. Uh, uh, you, you, can't, you can't reduce it to formula. If you, it, only observation will tell you. So and you need to know what type of orchid you're dealing with and how, uh, how much that orchid wants. Not how much water it wants, how much it wants to dry out. Okay. I can tell you how much water every uh, orchid wants. Every orchid wants as much water as you can give it when you water it. Mm -hmm. But it also wants to dry out to the degree that it wants to dry out. In the case of Cattleya, it's hard, hard, hard dry. In the case of Phalaenopsis, barely, barely dry. In the case of Vandas, quickly dry and wet again. So different orchids, uh, different things. You can't uh, keep the cow in the, uh, in the stream or the uh, fish in the pasture. It just doesn't work. Uh, you can't reduce things to formula. That's why we emphasize uh, observation. But controlling water is, is the key to controlling disease. If you can't control the uh, water, then uh, you are almost almost certainly going to have to uh, be sure that you have very bright growing conditions so that uh, uh, the uh, possibilities of fungus are reduced. Uh, you also want to make sure that you maximize air circulation so that uh, your plants dry out as quickly as possible. Don't ever overcrowd your plants uh, uh, because they will stay wet longer if they're crowded. The air won't be moving by them. Always grow all of your orchids in as bright a light as that type of orchid will uh, uh, tolerate. Uh, and because the brighter the light, the faster the drying. Uh, and uh, I, I built a solar dryer for my beloved wife. Uh, and uh, have any of you ever seen a solar dryer? It's called a clothesline. <laughs> you always put them in direct sunlight uh, because the more sunlight, the more quickly things, uh, things dry. Uh, and uh, uh, we want our orchids to always dry out quickly, particularly the foliage. We do not want foliage to uh, stay wet. That's why we typically recommend watering in the uh, morning. Uh, uh, and uh, so that the plants have all day to dry out, so they're not, don't put them to sleep uh, wet. Uh, uh, it's always a bad practice. 
Good cultural practices, of course, uh, are invaluable in disease control. Uh, a uh, spray program using a systemic fungicide like thiophanic methyl, again, uh, uh, always good stuff to do. And uh, the leaf swatting fungus can all be controlled, including the one that seems to spook everyone, this uh, Thai fungus that has the diamond-shaped lesions. It's called Philatostrictina capitata, and uh, it too is controlled by thiophanate methyl, but you have to spray it regularly. Uh, the problem there with that disease is that people, uh, it takes people unaware because uh, the infection takes place in September uh, and early October when we have all the wet, rainy weather and the disease symptoms don't show up until the fungus starts to fruit in uh, November or December or January when the first uh, cold snap uh, stress the plant. Uh, uh, but uh, it too is controlled by uh, thiophanate methyl, very, very good stuff, and controls nearly all of those leaf spotting uh, fungi. Uh, and they have all have strange names, uh, but uh, if you see spots uh, on your plants, you can probably control it with uh, thiophanate methyl. On the other hand, uh, there are two diseases that are, uh, uh, are very, very uh, uh, devastating. Pythium and Phytophthora are not exactly fungus, and they're not exactly bacteria. They are what we call water molds. They're different class of organisms. And these are the uh, diseases that produce black rot in cattleyas and crown rot in, uh, in Phalaenopsis and in Vandas. And they are devastating uh, diseases. Uh, they can wipe out a plant in a day or two or three. can go right through a, uh, a cattleya starting with a new growth and in three or four days it will have destroyed the entire plant. Uh, uh, if you see these, uh, you need to act immediately. Uh, you need to put that plant into a dry spot. You need to cut away all of the uh, diseased tissue. You need to dry it out. You need to observe your plants in the collection because by the time you see it, it's probably has the spores have spread to other plants. Uh, uh, but uh, that's not a good scenario. Not a good scenario. It uh, uh, gone with, without uh, control measures. Uh, you know, uh, these diseases can wipe out virtually an entire orchid collection in a week or 10 days. Yeah, uh, how can we uh, ID the different type of fungus or disease on the book? In the book, yes ma'am. Oh, okay. The book, the book, uh, uh, you can all, yes, or you can take them to the county agent. You can take them out to the University of Florida Subtropical Research Station here at Trek, uh, and uh, they will uh, tell you what the disease is, and they'll tell you what to cure it. You can, you can take a picture of it and send it to your county agent. The county ornamental uh, specialist should be able to identify it from a photo. You know, it, people send me pictures of their plants all the time. You can send me a picture. I will do my best for you, uh, and uh, uh, you can bring the plant along and uh, show it to someone. You can take it to an orchid society meeting and ask for experienced growers' advice. Uh, um, there's so much available uh, online now, I would really suggest that the best course of action is take a picture, get a hold of your county agent, and uh, email it to them. And uh, uh, this is a revolution in terms of where knowledge is coming from. but. Uh, um, there, these diseases that I'm talking about, Pythium and Phytophthora, totally devastating. Uh, uh, about, let's see how many years ago it was, uh, uh, about uh, 30 years ago, a young scientist uh, named uh, Robert McMillan, who is now an old scientist, retired from the University of Florida for about seven or eight years, uh, did a study on these two diseases and he took cattleya plants and he inoculated them with Pythium and Phytophthora. And uh, he, uh, uh, he then sprayed them with uh, uh, thio, uh, not, excuse me, he sprayed them with, uh, uh, with subdue uh, uh, and with uh, Aliette uh, and uh, uh, he left one group as a control. What do you suppose happened to the control? They all died, every single one of them. Uh, those that he sprayed with uh, subdue, he uh, managed to save about 89% of them. Those that he sprayed with Aliette, he saved 93%. These are plants that were infected with the disease. 
He knew they were infected because he infected them. 93%. So if you uh, have a problem with uh, uh, the... Uh, oh, actually, he, uh, uh, he gave them another uh, uh, chemical as well, Truban. Uh, and with Truban, he managed to save about 60%, uh, 65% of the plants involved. Uh, so uh, uh, the best, best chemical to both prevent and to cure these diseases is Aliet. We, in fact, don't use it because we use subdue. Aliette costs about five or six times as much as subdue. Uh, and uh, uh, that's the good news for subdue. The bad news for subdue is the smallest size you can buy it in is uh, uh, enough to last me in this greenhouse for about uh, two or three years. So it's much, much more than you want to have of that, uh, that substance. Aliette, on the other hand, is expensive, but well worth it. Uh, a two pound bag will probably cost you in the range of $100, uh, but it will last you for five or six or seven or eight years. It's like a, a 10 years even. It's, it's like making a 10 or $15 investment in, uh, in the safety of your orchid collection uh, um, um, for that $100. Uh, and uh, it's a big bite at the beginning, but uh, they keep it in a cool, dry place. Uh, when you're buying any kind of chemical, if you can buy a powder form, it'll last uh, almost indefinitely. Uh, liquids tend to break down more. They're more problematical because of the uh, materials that are used to dissolve the chemicals. Oftentimes, petroleum distillates, uh, kerosene in essence. Uh, so always use uh, uh, powder forms of chemicals uh, whenever possible. Uh, so I recommend you uh, Aliette, I recommend you spray it on a, uh, a regular basis across the summer or at the very least have it in your, your cupboard so that if you see a problem with the Pythium or Phytophthora, again we have the pictures of them in the book, black rot, you'll know it uh, in a heartbeat, uh, hit uh, devastating disease, you can stop it in its tracks. Uh, I could show you crowns of vandas. Uh, I could take you to the greenhouse and show you crowns of vandas that uh, when we start to notice that, uh, uh, that we're getting a little bit of crown rot, we will spray with subdue. And uh, these chemicals are so effective that they will stop this stuff dead in its tracks. You can see the brown tip of the leaf and the disease has been stopped. So these things are very, very effective. They're well worth investing in. Uh, the other chemical, Truban, is available in combination with thiophanate methyl uh, uh, in a, uh, uh, a compound called uh, uh, Banrot is the name of the chemical combination of uh, thiophanate methyl with uh, Truban is a chemical called Banrot. Uh, and it's a very effective chemical and it's a simpler homeowner solution. It's less expensive, uh, but if you spray it on a regular basis, uh, again, uh, doing it uh, the way I suggested to you, both of these are systemic chemicals, initial spraying, two weeks, and then every uh, five to six weeks afterwards, you'll get very good control with, uh, uh, with Banrot. Uh, so, uh, uh, okay, what else do we have? Uh, diseases. Uh, that covers most of the diseases except for that, uh, that dreadful southern blight that I told you about. Uh, and, uh, but there are, uh, those are fungal diseases. Uh, there are bacterial diseases that uh, attack orchids, uh, mostly Phalaenopsis. Uh, and uh, uh, Phalaenopsis uh, are uh, uh, subject to uh, two uh, bacteria. Bacterial diseases are very, very fast spreading also. They will appear as a spot on your leaf of a Phalaenopsis uh, and they will oftentimes spread uh, through the uh, plant uh, within a day or two and can kill the entire plant. You can always tell if it's a bacterial infection by smelling it. If it stinks, then it's bacteria. Fungus, fungi smell kind of funky, like the bottom of a pond, but uh, bacteria, uh, 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 bacteria, uh, or, uh, uh, Pseudomonas is the other uh, bacteria uh, that uh, affects Phalaenopsis. Uh, so, uh, um, Erwinia and Pseudomonas are the two bacteria that affect uh, uh, Phalaenopsis. They also will affect Vandas uh, if they're grown in too low a light. You'll occasionally see them on other genera, usually when the plant has been grown a little bit too soft, not enough light, no, perhaps too much fertilizer. You can get Pseudomonas or Erwinia infections and other things. We see it occasionally in, uh, um, 
in, uh, uh, on Vandas, particularly the softer leaved ones. Vanda denisoniana has a propensity to come up with it on occasion. So what do we do to cure this? Well, these diseases that I've just talked to you about, Pseudomonas and Erwinia, uh, also by some chance happen to be diseases of tomatoes. Have you ever noticed how fast a tomato goes rotten? It starts out with a little spot on it and bam, the next day it's the whole tomato is rotten. Same disease, same problem. Our friends, the tomato growers, came up with the solution. Uh, and the solution is a combination of uh, copper and uh, uh, mancozep. Uh, uh, copper uh, is toxic to uh, epiphytes, but uh, it's much more toxic to bacteria. Uh, the uh, forms that we get it in are usually cupric hydroxide, which is uh, sold under the brand name uh, uh, Champion or uh, Cocide. That's K-O-C-I-D-E. Cocide uh, is uh, cupric hydroxide. It is uh, uh, very, very effective as a uh, fungicide and bactericide, but it's even more effective in combination with the fungicide Mancozeb, which is uh, sold under the brand names of uh, Manzate or Dithane M45. This is all in the book. Uh, all of this information is in, the, in both of these books. Uh, and what you want to do is you want to combine those two chemicals, one tablespoon per gallon, and uh, you mix them and you let it stand for several hours or even overnight. You have now tank mixed another chemical. And uh, again, we suggest that you spray this chemical prophylactically on your phalaenopsis. We suggest that at more or less the same intervals as your general spray program uh, is, uh, uh, is done, beginning the first week in May. But instead of spraying in two weeks, you want to wait nearly two months and spray again the first week in July. And then you want to spray again the thir uh, third or fourth week in August and then you want to stop. And the reason you want to stop is that uh, the copper is toxic to your orchids. If you spray it more than the three times a year that I'm suggesting to you, you can do your orchids a great deal of damage. And I can tell you that not from my own experience, but from the experience of some orchid growers who found out how good this stuff was. Oh, this is the greatest stuff since sliced bread, you know? And if it's good, if a little bit is good, a lot has got to be better. Not true. Uh, uh, what they did was they actually destroyed all the chlorophyll in their uh, the leaves of their Phalaenopsis. And people lost thousands of Phalaenopsis plants by spraying it uh, too often. The other reason you want to stop in August is that your Phalaenopsis will uh, be starting to spike not too long after that. And this stuff is going to coat your plants with a blue-green uh, uh, film that looks kind of ugly. And you want your plants as well as your flowers to look beautiful uh, when they're in flower. So uh, you don't want that ugly uh, blue-green uh, fungicide on there during the uh, uh, time when they're flowering. And these two diseases, Pseudomonas and Erwinia, are diseases of hot weather. What happens uh, in hot weather is that your Phalaenopsis, with their big, broad uh, leaves, which are very efficient light gatherers, also gather a great deal of heat. And the reaction of the Phalaenopsis to that heat is to open up all of its stomatae. And when it opens those stomatae, uh, the, uh, the spores of uh, the Pseudomonas and Erwinia, which are everywhere, or you're breathing them right now, uh, uh, and the plant is breathing them too. And that's where these effect infections come from, usually in the hot weather of uh, June, July, August, that's when we see them most frequently, and they can be devastating, as I said, uh, but not uh, to worry if you have got the preventive spray program uh, in, in motion. Uh, okay, so we have leaf spotting fungi, we have uh, the water molds, uh, we have uh, bacterial uh, diseases, we have southern blight, which you can look up in the book there uh, and see how to deal with it. It's fairly rare, fortunately, uh, uh, but devastating. There's one more set of uh, diseases that uh, are 
common with orchids and uh, problematical. And that is virus. There are two viruses that we know of for sure that affect orchids. And there may be one or two others out there, but uh, uh, these are uh, viruses that, uh, vi symptoms of virus in an orchid can be either very dramatic or they can be virtually non-existent. And the only way to absolutely uh, tell whether uh, a orchid is virused is by having it tested. And there's a little laboratory test, you can buy them online to test your plants if you like also, which uh, will tell you whether the plant is virused. Uh, virus plants can be look perfectly normal, they can flower perfectly normally, uh, uh, they uh, can grow with a great deal of vigor, probably a little less vigor than they would if they didn't uh, have the virus, but uh, vigorous growing orchids can just kind of withstand uh, viruses. We all have a lot of viruses uh, percolating around in us uh, and uh, we manage to uh, get on with things anyway. Uh, the same with your orchids, but uh, you do not want to spread virus in your plants. For some orchid growers, viruses are so much of an anathema, you know, it's just uh, as if, uh, you know, a dark satanic force had been unleashed, unleashed in their, uh, their orchid collection. We see this a little more up north than uh, down here, and uh, one of the reasons for that is that down here, if you uh, suspect that you have a plant that has a virus, you have a very simple solution uh, to isolate it uh, that is not problemat problematical. You can just put the damn thing out in a tree or hang it somewhere out in your yard where it's away from your other orchids. Uh, and, uh, but viruses are not spread by water, and viruses are not spread by casual con uh, contact. Uh, uh, this is what spreads virus, cutting tools. And viruses uh, are halfway between being a chemical and being a living thing. They're the, one of the first steps up in the evolutionary process. What they are are uh, protein molecules, hard protein molecules that have learned how to reproduce themselves or have evolved to reproduce themselves more accurately. So they are tough to kill. Bacteria, fungi, you know, are relatively easy to uh, eliminate. Virus, when they're on a cutting tool, are tough, tough, tough. Uh, you can use uh, one of the standard uh, recommendations is to uh, make a super saturated uh, solution of trisodium phosphate, which is used for cleaning walls before you paint. Uh, and the way you make a, a super saturated solution is you, uh, you keep pouring it into uh, hot water until it becomes uh, a uh, slurry and starts to thicken up, uh, or when you take it off the heat, it thickens up afterwards. Uh, it's kind of messy to use. Uh, Clorox is very effective. Uh, uh, we had a pharmacist uh, who is a serious orchidist, and he swore by Clorox for sterilizing cutting instruments. Uh, uh, Clorox will eat up your, your cutting instruments very, very quickly. Uh, what we use is pool algicide. Uh, uh, you can buy it down at uh, Home Depot uh, as pool time. It's 20 percent, uh, uh, and it is an ammonium chloride uh, compound. Uh, and uh, I can show you the container in the nursery, uh, uh, but uh, it's relatively inexpensive. Uh, uh, it is the same chemical as you buy as a uh, uh, as a horticultural chemical under the brand names Fisan or Consan, uh, uh, and but uh, you're not now you're not buying a uh, uh, a horticultural chemical. You're just buying a regular pool chemical. So the cost is much much less. Uh, uh, you uh, can uh, take that and you can cut it by two or uh, three times and dip your instruments into it. We like, in fact, when we're uh, uh, cutting plants, uh, cutting any number of plants, to have two instruments, one in the solution, one outside of the solution. They need to stand for a little bit in there. You want to avoid getting organic material into that uh, solution because the organic material will uh, dilute the effectiveness of the chemicals. You want to change that uh, chemical solution every few days, uh, uh, and it's, or if you've used it a great deal. And it's very effective in, in, uh, in sterilizing your instruments and preventing, preventing so virus. Yes, I can show you. It's called pool time uh, algicide. It's algicide. 
And uh, they also use the same chemical in hospitals to uh, sterilize uh, surfaces. Uh, uh, and like so much else in life, what you're buying it for will determine to a large degree how much you're going to be paying it for, paying for it. So buying it as a pool algicide is the most ac economical way to do it. Uh, and chemicals are chemicals are chemicals. The most effective ad of my lifetime uh, was the ad for Morton Salt. Uh, no salt salts like Morton Salt salts. I don't know whether any of you remember that ad, but uh, every salt salts exactly like Morton Salt salts. There's no difference between salt. Uh, salt is salt is salt. And uh, these uh, quadrinary ammonium chloride compounds are all basically the same. Uh, the only benefit from having two or more of them in there is you might get a slight synergistic uh, uh, effect there, but uh, basically uh, they're disinfectants and they're very, very effective. What about using like straight ammonia? I don't know what effect ammonia would have. Uh, uh, I th what you have to do is you have to, what we're seeking to do with all of these uh, um, all of these chemicals that I've mentioned to you is we're seeking to oxidize that uh, organism so strongly that uh, basically it, uh, it's dissolved. You have, to, you have to have a chemical that's going to dissolve the, uh, that uh, outer protein core uh, uh, case of the, uh, of the virus. That's, that's what we're looking to do. And uh, uh, whether ammonia, uh, ammonia would do that or not, I am not sure. I am not a chemist. But uh, you could ask a chemist. Uh, the, um, so that's it on virus. But remember, uh, uh, keep your tools clean. Tip them in a, a sterilizing solution. And again, the one we recommend is this pool algicide at a, at a fairly strong strength. It's fairly economical. A half gallon of it is uh, just under $10. So, you know, it's a $10 investment in keeping your orchids virus-free. <coughs> virus-free. Okay. Let us talk about, uh, uh, do you have any more questions about uh, diseases? So, I have a question. When you mentioned that are fungicides that are systemic, so majority of the banda, they don't grow in any potting media, so... A spreader sticker, uh, and uh, uh, it, uh, um, it uh, sometimes systemics are it's recommended that uh, with systemic chemicals you do not use a, uh, a spreader sticker. And the reason for that is that uh, if you, on most plants, if you use a spreader sticker, the chemical will be held at the surface of the plant and not absorbed. But most orchids are very waxy, and if you don't use a spreader sticker, then a lot of the chemical will be washed, washed off before it's absorbed. So uh, I learned this uh, during the Ben Light uh, fiasco because I was a clever boy and I knew you shouldn't use uh, uh, spreader stickers with uh, systemics. And so I didn't use it when I used Benlate. And we had problems with Benlate, but we didn't have as much problems as other people because there wasn't as much of it being absorbed. So if you use a systemic on orchids, use a spreader sticker. Using it on tomatoes, uh, you, you wouldn't want to do that, okay? Um, we had somebody who brought a sample in here. First, we have to ask, how long since your last confession, madam? Uh, <laughs> Yellow, okay. Um, all right, uh, what we've got here uh, is a yellow leaf. And uh, sometimes the woods decay, the woods decay and fall, and after many a summer dies the swan. Yes, and that too happens to orchid leaves. This is, it looks like a vanda leaf that uh, has uh, gotten old, but it's also gotten stressed. Um, we've had a little bit of cold weather, and that has uh, gotten this vanda to decide that, well, maybe I could use one or two less leaves here, and I would be able to sustain myself better. It has a few other little things here. You see the small spots here on this leaf? That, uh, you notice, you see the spot there? You see the, uh, the spot on this side? But look on the other side. You don't see any spot. You know what that tells you? No, no. <laughs> well, you're about to learn. <laughs> uh, that tells you that that is not a fungus that has caused that spot. It, it's not, that's not a fungus. It's not a disease. It, it's a, uh, that damage was caused by mites. 
uh, mites like nice soft leaves. I think we might as well just go ahead and talk about mites since we've moved on to pests. But uh, what we've illustrated here at this point is that sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference between damage that's caused uh, by uh, fungus and damage that's caused by uh, mites or other insects or other, uh, other problems, other natural conditions. Uh, uh, there are also a, a whole group of, uh, uh, of diseases, uh, of problems uh, that, are, uh, that have no uh, biological agent involved with them. Uh, these, are, uh, uh, these are things like uh, edemas, which seem to cause people a lot of, uh, of difficulty understanding. And they're just uh, non-pathological, uh, uh, non, uh, non-biological uh, plant abnormalities uh, and uh, interesting stuff. But mites, uh, mites are a difficult one. People don't quite understand mites. They usually are puzzled by mite damage. Uh, it um, is, uh, um, it's a good thing to, uh, to control uh, mites uh, uh, and uh, you'll see uh, a lot of benefits in your orchids if you do control mites. Uh, mites like two things, they like high temperatures and they like dry conditions. Uh, and again, if you're keeping your orchids dry, as you should, uh, and if the temperatures are high, which they oftentimes are, then your chances of having problems with mites are, uh, are, are fairly high. Uh, to understand how to control mites, you need to understand the life cycle uh, from uh, the uh, egg to the point that uh, a mite is mature and reproducing uh, is a period of about 12 days. So they reproduce incredibly quickly and uh, in vast numbers they can go from being just a minor problem to being a fairly uh, major one like on the leaf of your Rancostylus there uh, more rapidly than one would like to think of but uh, uh, in order to control them you always need to spray twice two sprayings to control mites. Uh, if you spray once, uh, you may even be lucky enough to kill all of the mites uh, with that one spraying, uh, but uh, you're unlikely to kill all of their eggs. So what you need to do is you need to calculate uh, uh, how to be sure we're going to kill all of those eggs uh, when they hatch. Uh, and we do that by giving them a second spraying at seven to 10 days. That's between seven and 10 days, all of the eggs of the previous generation will have hatched. Now you can kill them too. So you're gonna spray once, and then you're gonna spray again in seven to 10 days exactly. And uh, uh, what are you going to spray with? Well, there, there are uh, actually some good home uh, remedy choices. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the one that uh, is, uh, you can use all year round is soap. If you take two uh, uh, ounces of, uh, that would be four tablespoons of, uh, uh, of liquid detergent, washing up detergent, we recommend, uh, we recommend Ajax. Uh, Ajax is, uh, uh, is very, very good uh, stuff and it is very, very inexpensive. They have the strange for an American company uh, policy of producing a good quality product and selling it uh, at a good price and uh, making up on the volume what, rather than spending the money on advertising. Uh, and so uh, two ounces of Ajax liquid uh, uh, detergent, washing up detergent, dishwashing detergent in a uh, gallon of water you need to spray it thoroughly so that it washes into all of the nooks and crannies and crevices, the leaf axles of vandas, and uh, uh, that's a very, very good thing. Uh, uh, it, uh, uh, it is uh, it's very effective. Uh, uh, mites cannot build up a resistance to it because uh, it's an organic cure, uh, and it's a good thing. When the weather is cooler, when the temperatures are below, say, uh, 85 uh, degrees uh, Fahrenheit, uh, uh, or uh, 30 degrees Celsius, say, uh, the, uh, uh, you can use oil. And uh, in fact, you can just use regular cooking oil. Uh, doesn't need to be olive oil, uh, save that for the salad, but you can just use a canola. And uh, here uh, we want three tablespoons per gallon, and we want to keep it in agitation. Uh, but you mustn't spray the oil in hot weather. If the temperature is going to get above 86, uh, 
do not spray that oil. That's why we recommend uh, uh, spraying it in November through right now when we put out the next newsletter. Here uh, with the warm weather we've been having, we're going to recommend that if you haven't sprayed with oil, you spray immediately so that you can get that spraying in before it gets too hot. But if you're spraying oil and, uh, uh, and soap, the sequence is first spray the uh, oil, and then seven to ten days later spray the soap. You want to wash some of that oil off of the plants because the oil can clog up those stomata we were talking about and uh, it can cause you grief. So uh, those two things, soap and oil, are uh, the uh, home cures for, uh, for mites. And they can be very effective if you uh, do it on a regular basis, uh, two, uh, once or twice across the winter. Uh, and if you get a period of hot weather, hot, dry weather in the middle of the summer, you uh, can spray uh, then again. Uh, uh, you can definitely spray Phalaenopsis and plants that are being grown under cover. And uh, uh, it, uh, they are prone to mites because uh, they're dry and uh, it's, uh, it's a good thing. There are chemicals, uh, other chemicals that you can spray. They're all listed in the uh, Florida Orchid Growing and Florida Vanda Growing. We use Bifrin, which is uh, sold under the brand name Talstar. It's very, very effective. Uh, there are a number of other uh, chemicals that uh, you can buy um, that uh, will control mites. But uh, soap and oil can be very effective, and they're, at, they're on your kitchen uh, shelf. So uh, the key, though, is absolutely that uh, 7 to 10 day interval. Okay. All right, good. Are we good on mites? All right. Uh, there's another, there's an insect that is problematical here in South Florida, and it is called a thrips. Now people will talk about, uh, there you go, there's a testimonial to how horrible it is. Uh, uh, you'll hear orchid growers talk about uh, thrip damage. There's no such thing as a thrip. They're all thrips, just like there's no such thing as a phalaenopsis. They're all phalaenopsis. One phalaenopsis, a dozen phalaenopsis. One thrips, a million thrips, right? The problem with thrips are that uh, there are two problems with thrips. One is that they are ubiquitous. They are like original sin. They are always with you. Uh, and, uh, the, uh, uh, and they are ubiquitous because they are out here in your lawn. They're in the uh, 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 trees in our yard. They love mangoes. We once had a mango, a Filipino mango, that was supposed to be such a delicious mango. and. We grew it for about six or seven years, and I think we had about four mangoes off that tree, and we might have had four million thrips. And uh, they like the little white, uh, uh, daisy-like uh, 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 flower, Spanish needles. Uh, they like numerous things that are just growing in your yard. So that if you have a period when you have more than four or five days when it hasn't rained, and the temperature is above 80 degrees, I can almost guarantee you that those thrips that are out there in your yard are going to be beating a caravan path to your orchid collection, which is an oasis in the vast desert out there. The first symptom of, uh, uh, of damage uh, from thrips in, a, uh, in orchids are uh, uh, a pitting, where just the, the green meets the, uh, uh, the white of a new Vanda root. Uh, and it will look as if it's been sandblasted, as if you know it has a pitted appearance. Uh, uh, but uh, thrips cause all kinds of other uh, problems. This time of year, one of the most frequent uh, questions we're asked is, why do the uh, flower spikes on my Vandas get about that long and stop growing? The answer is thrips. Another frequently asked question about this time of year is, why do my Vanda spikes only open one or two flowers and then the last uh, th uh, three or four flowers fall off? The answer is thrips. Um, the uh, uh, Tom Fennell uh, of Orchid Jungle grew orchids, man and boy, here in South Florida for uh, 60 years. And he once asked me about, uh, oh, maybe 30 years ago, uh, 
he asked me, Martin, do you know what causes those kind of pale, uh, whitish, uh, sunken lesions on a new Cattleya growth? And you know what? I didn't know. And Tom went to his grave, never knowing that that too was caused by thrips. Thrips are public enemy number one. Uh, and, uh, but uh, the beneficial side of it is that uh, they also are like the canary in the mine shaft. Uh, they are telling you that when you see thrips damage, it's telling you that you've got problems with insects. What I'm going to suggest to you uh, uh, in terms of curing, uh, um, curing thrips uh, uh, is uh, going to cure you of just about every insect problem in your orchid collection. The cure for thrips will cure uh, scale crawlers. It will cr kill, uh, cure. Um, uh, it will cure uh, uh, mealybugs. Uh, even will eliminate the wily cucaracha in your orchid collection. Uh, uh, what we like uh, to use for uh, thrips, you can use soap. Soap is very effective against thrips. Uh, again, you need to make sure that it washes into the, uh, the nooks and the, uh, the crannies of uh, the plant, and uh, uh, it, it is quite effective. Again, uh, two ounces per gallon. Uh, when you first see the symptoms appear, make sure that you uh, get it on there. We like to do it overnight. I like to spray them uh, with soap in the evening in particular. And because uh, thrips are very nocturnal, they, uh, they don't like light. That's why they like the inside of flower buds. They hide in the leaf axils of vandas. That's where they're attacking that new growth before it even emerges. You can see them. Uh, they're visible. Uh, they're like a, a, a thin little uh, ant. Uh, usually they're brown or black. I've seen some pretty bright orange ones on occasion. They, they come in a whole range of colors and unlike uh, ants they will make kind of quick darting uh, motions. You usually see them in the morning because the temperatures are lower, they've been slowed down a little bit, they're out and away from wherever they want to spend the day, uh, like in your buds of your flowers uh, or in the leaf axils of your plant. Uh, and, uh, but if you see them they're attracted to white they are very attracted to yellow and they're very attracted to blue. That's why they love vandas so much, because uh, they come in uh, uh, yellows and, uh, and blues. Uh, but uh, they're attracted to all kinds of flowers and, and they're, uh, uh, they are, uh, um, they are, as I say, ubiquitous. They are going to be appearing in your orchid collection whenever the conditions are hot enough and dry enough for long enough. Uh, Soap can be quite effective. What we like to use, and what we think is the most effective uh, that's readily available, is a uh, chemical called acetone. Uh, not acetone, acetate. Uh, acetate. Acetate is um, uh, acetate is usually sold under the brand name Orthene. You oftentimes, you know, if you ask for Orthene, they'll give you whatever generic one they have. And uh, it is very effective because it is a local systemic. It will get into like the flower spikes and the, uh, the roots and it will linger there for uh, several weeks. Uh, and the only drawback of it is that it smells dreadful. It smells for all the world like those chemical toilets at the national parks. Just absolutely dreadful. But you come to love it because you think of it as the smell of dead thrips. Uh, and uh, it's like napalm in the morning. It's a good thing. Uh, it, it's a good smell. Uh, but uh, orthene is very effective. There are one or two others that we recommend in Florida orchid growing. Again, bifrin, which is uh, usually uh, sold under the brand name Talstar, is both, it will kill both mites and uh, the thrips. And it's quite effective. It's a good, uh, that is a synthetic pyrethrin. It's a syn synthetic uh, form of something that is, occurs as a natural product. Whether that makes it less, less toxic, I don't know. Uh, nicotine sulfate is one of the most uh, toxic chemicals out there. I don't think you can even buy it anymore. Uh, it's that dangerous, but uh, it is nicotine. So it goes. Uh, all right. Um, okay, good. So that's how you control thrips. Uh, if you spray uh, the often enough to keep the thrips under control in your uh, uh, greenhouse, you will control all of the mites. There's only one time we have ever had mites in our greenhouses because of our spray program for thrips. We hired these people from Texas and they brought their Phalaenopsis with them from Texas. And they had not just regular mealybugs, but they had case hardened. We grow them bigger in Texas. 
uh, mealy bugs. And uh, uh, we had to spray with stronger stuff. But once we eliminated those, uh, those Texas mealy bugs, we never had a problem with mealy bugs again. Uh, and uh, so mealy bugs would not be a problem if you spray properly for thrips. Um, scale can be a persistent uh, problem because the uh, things that we spray for thrips will not control the hardened scale. And uh, it will control all the, the uh, crawlers so that you won't get, get it spreading if you have uh, uh, good uh, regular spraying for thrips. But in order to control scale, you're going to need something stronger. And again, uh, the, the best thing is uh, you can use uh, organophosphates like malathion. Uh, but the very best thing is to spray in cooler weather with a combination of oil and an organic organophosphate like malathion. If you spray uh, organophosphate and uh, malathion, uh, then you will, uh, uh, you will control the, uh, uh, the, uh, the oil with an organophosphate like malathion. And uh, you will kill the, uh, the ones that are not killed by the uh, malathion are suffocated by the oil and, uh, uh, and vice versa. The ones that are not suffocated are killed by the, you get a synergistic effect when you use those two chemicals together. And you will not see another scale insect in your collection for six months, I guarantee it. Guarantee it. Uh, so, uh, okay, good. Uh, um, what else? Uh, you have a question? We tend to do it by scouting for the, uh, uh, the thrips, but again, if you've had a period, uh, we, we do it uh, ad hoc, but uh, if you've had a period of four or five days without rain and a temperature above uh, 85 uh, uh, degrees uh, Fahrenheit, 30 degrees Celsius, you can be fairly sure you're going to have thrips. Well, we will spray under those circumstances. We won't let it go a week without spraying under those circumstances. And it doesn't matter what time of year. And then how much do you mix up the uh, organic? It depends upon the formulation that you've bought. Uh, about a teaspoon usually, but check. you always check the label. Okay. Always check the label. Okay. Uh, all right, good. Hey, I think we've covered all the major pests and things. I just wanted to speak to you a few words about it. We've been talking about a lot of chemicals here. And uh, in South Florida, I really feel they're a necessary evil. But uh, uh, I want to caution you, uh, it, it's uh, worth investing. If you're going to use chemicals, it's worth investing in some equipment. Buy yourself a respirator. They cost about $30. They'll last you for years and years. Buy yourself a good set of gloves, a good, good kitchen uh, dishwashing gloves. They're very, very good. Uh, always, always, always wear long sleeves, uh, pants and, uh, and uh, uh, shirts. Uh, uh, always wear a hat when you're spraying because uh, if the chemical uh, starts drifting towards you, you want to be able to turn your head downward with a beaked cap uh, of some sort so that the chemical does not, uh, is not able to drift into your eyes or onto your face. Uh, and, uh, uh, and all the chemicals that I've recommended to you uh, so far are not particularly dangerous. And uh, uh, if you protect yourself in the fashion that I'm talking about, you will be less exposed to chemicals when you're spraying than you probably are in your office when you're working at your desk. Because the little guy coming around and spraying every uh, month or so, you know, who knows what he's spraying, how much he's spraying, and your air conditioning system is picking it up and it is recirculating it right into your lungs. Uh, and so when the EPA, and I'm giving you, I'm telling you the truth, when the EPA tests workers, not the EPA, but uh, OSHA, uh, Occupational uh, uh, Health and uh, Safety, test workers. Who do you think tests with most pesticides in their blood? Agricultural workers or office workers? Office. office, absolutely, because agricultural workers, if I had an agricultural worker working for me and I didn't protect him properly and he showed up with that chemical in, uh, in his blood, uh, he would go out and find a shyster lawyer like my son and would sue the hell out of me. Uh, so I'm not gonna let that happen. Uh, and you mustn't let it happen to yourself either. Uh, uh, but uh, there's one more caution I want to make on using uh, chemicals uh, uh, is uh, always put that equipment on before you even think about handling that package of chemical. Remember, when you're, if you're putting a, a, uh, two tablespoons of something into a gallon of water, when those two tablespoons are in the tablespoon, they are 250 times stronger than they're going to be when they're in the spray. 
So be very careful when you're, when you're mixing chemicals, okay? And make sure you have all your protection in place, your mask, your uh, uh, things, and uh, uh, don't, lick the spoon. don't lick the spoon, absolutely. You do not lick the spoon. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, don't bite your fingernails either. Right? It's, that's one of those rules. That's one of the three things you need to know to be a plumber. You don't bite your fingernails, uh, stuff don't flow uphill, uh, payday's Friday, the boss is a son of a bitch. So, that's, uh, that's all you really need to know, but uh, yeah, don't lick the spoon for sure. And uh, uh, actually what you really should do with the spoon is you should uh, rinse it uh, and, and, and put the rinse water into the whatever tank uh, you're, you're doing. The same with, uh, uh, and when you wash out your uh, spray equipment, which you should do, always triple rinse it. If you rinse something three times, then you'll usually be reducing the concentration of the chemical in it to parts per billion, which is usually a good thing to do. Any more questions, guys? We have burned up most of an hour. So is there something that you use like on a monthly basis throughout the whole year? We, we do spray on a regular basis with uh, uh, these uh, preventive chem chemicals for uh, our leaf spotting. We spray on a preventative basis for thrips and, and for mites. Uh, those spray programs are outlined in Florida Orchid Growing. And uh, there's a, a model spray program to follow in there which suggests you spray particular fungicides and particular uh, chemicals on a regular basis. Uh, you know, the road to hell is always paved with good intentions and, uh, you know, you can always grow things just a little bit better uh, and with more, more care and more attention. And uh, we, uh, we don't always do as well as we would like to, but uh, we've gotten, gotten much better, gotten much better. I finally have good help. It's wonderful. So it goes. Okay, hey, well, you've been a great audience, uh, and uh, Nick hopefully has the uh, footage he needs to package up another wonderful uh, video of the Ancient One uh, discanting, and uh, we'll get it up on the, at the website. You all do know about the website of Moats Orchids. So.